I have all access that I haven't had for a month. So my screen looks normal and I have my background, but I don't, I didn't do anything differently. So I have no idea. But I have all my controls, which is new. Oh, you're muted. Okay. Now, no, I, I don't have the ability to blur my background out today. Well, we didn't, neither one of us did last week. And now I do, I did, but, and again, I have all my controls, so I don't, yeah. Yeah. So everybody just gets to see my ironing board. Well, I was super nervous because they're, they didn't finish my roof yesterday, so they're back. So I'm in the basement. And so I was really nervous to turn my camera on, but I had a background today. So. Maybe I'll move my ironing board. <laughs> there, now you can see my cute little quilt that's almost done. Well, then my lighting is off. So when I put my glasses on, all I can see is the, the glare, which yeah. messes with my eyes more. So yeah, really I'll be happy when they're done upstairs so I can return to my office. I don't really like the black. I don't. I haven't tried the white one yet. But... The white one's not quite so. Yeah. Like you're in a hole. Yeah. I haven't been compliant and put either one of them on, so. At least in the basement, you don't hear the wind we have today. Well, no, but these roofing guys are really, really loud. Yesterday, they should have been done yesterday, but somehow, some well, some way, I went upstairs to go to the bathroom and went to the bathroom in my bedroom and they had poked a hole through my ceiling. So I don't know if when they replaced the piece, somebody's foot went down through my attic I or they dropped a very heavy tool, but we now have to replace the ceiling in our bedroom bathroom. Well, that's part of why they're bonded. <laughs> Yeah, they so, get to do that. Yeah, it's been a lovely week. Um, make sure they run the magnet around your house about four times to pick up all the roofing nails. Oh yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. My little doggy won't like that. The last time we did had a roof done, Brian asked him to leave the magnet, the roller magnet thing. For several days, and he went out and multiple times went around the house and picked up roofing nails. Mm. Because he didn't want the flat tire on the mowing equipment. Yes. It's gotten crazy windy today. I, I can hear parts of it in between them. They must be at lunch break. I think it's rattling the side of my house. And it's from the south, straight south. I am all but done with those phone calls I was making. Okay. Um, two of them are taking, the two I've talked to are taking care of the issue today. And I'm gonna do some charting in, um, if, do the, ref, the survey for the ones that have closed because those are easy and I don't need information. So I'll start working on those today. Well, and I um, I've put notes in that spreadsheet, so I hope I'm getting what you need to know. Okay. I'm related to the person I just talked to twice. On both sides of my family. Related on my dad's side and my mom's side. It's like, okay, this is weird. <laughs> it's a little weird. <laughs> this is session five, right? Four. Yes. Five. Okay. Yes. You know, are we scheduled to be next Friday? Let me look. 
because we probably should have skipped next Friday because we're not working next Friday. Nope, Dana was ahead of us. Okay. We're good. I want to have that little quilt back there done. So when they get here next week, it's on his bed, ready to go. Welcome everyone. I see some are starting to join us now. So I just wanted to say hello and thank you for joining us today. This is our project first line session five. Um, as I noted in chat, if you would type your name and email or your email and organization in chat, that for one, helps us to keep accurate records and two, it allows us to have a database so we can send um, resources and follow up materials as needed. And we have about three minutes and we will get started. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our Project First Line Session 5. It is now 11 a.m. Again, if you have not already typed your name, organization, email, and chat, please do so. That allows us to keep accurate attendance records and be able to send you follow-up materials as needed. So at this time, I will pass to Nadine. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Nadine. Welcome to the 5th session of our project 1st line for communal living settings. And as you may recall, today, we were going to um, review what we've learned over the last. The past few sessions about how COVID 19 spreads and Brenda, I just want to make sure. 
that you are seeing the presentation slides. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, um, I already said hello. So today, our this is what we're going to cover. And um, our objective is an easy one today. We're going to describe two ways that SARS-CoV-2 spreads. And um, we've talked about a lot, so we'll just cover a little bit more. So far, we've covered the, um, we're gonna review these concepts and think about what questions have been answered and what new questions we have. And you might remember a slide similar to this from our very first session. On the left are the topics that we've started to cover. And on the right are broader themes and topics included across the training series. And which topics on the right do you think that you understand better than you did before we started this series? Feel free to either chat in or to unmute and tell us. So we're looking at the right hand side, the broader themes and topics. Do we have anything in chat? You guys should be able to say a couple of these things at the top of the list. I'll give you a big old hint. Okay. So, um, Nadine, we do have a question. What was the original question? I think folks were still trying to sign in. Oh, okay. So, of these lists of things, the list on the left is the what are the topics that we've covered so far, and the list on the right are those things that they're broader themes and topics. And I asked if you could please say, of these topics on the right, what do you think you understand better than you did before? We have a few comments here, um, microbiology basics and triage. And then we have a comment about, we have a better handle on how the virus spreads, respiratory droplets and surfaces for a time. Okay. So now on the left-hand side, let's look at this list and um, hopefully we've all learned together some new information. So let's take a minute to reflect on that learning. So I want you to just take a piece of paper and in thinking about um, what you we've covered, fill in content based on what we've covered so far. So this is your chance to jot down what you've learned and what you still want to know and try and put something in all three of the columns. So the first column is what I know now. Second column is what I think I know. And the third column is what I want to know. And I'm gonna give you guys a minute to do that. So let's then, um, since you've been thinking about it, can you go ahead and chat in what you want to know. I'd like to hear now what you want to know that we haven't covered so far. One lingering question we had from last time was how long the virus can stay active on a surface. Okay. Depends on the type of virus. That's a conditional question. Anything else that you wanna to add to the what I want to know list? Okay. 
We'll go ahead and move on to the next slide, which is the video. So let's see if we can, um, gosh, and my controls, of course, are not here today. Here, maybe. Do you see the video screen, Brenda? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let me make sure my volume is turned up. Before I start it. And I'm going to go ahead and start and move to full screen. So let's hear what Dr. Carlson has to tell us today about how COVID-19 spreads and reviewing that topic. Hello again, everybody. I'm Abby Carlson. I'm an infectious diseases doctor at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention here in Atlanta, Georgia. And you may have been watching these videos in our Inside Infection Control series for a little while. If so, thank you very much. If not, welcome. We're going to take a minute to summarize some of the things that we have covered so far. In this series, we focused on how germs spread and specifically on how the virus SARS-CoV-2, which causes the disease COVID-19, gets from person to person. The main way SARS-CoV-2 spreads is by respiratory droplets. That's when somebody who's infected breathes out at, or coughs or talks, and the water in their breath, those little tiny droplets of water that are carrying virus particles, they reach a person who's close by. Then those droplets are breathed in or land on the eyes, and this can happen whether the infected person knows they're infected or not. Okay. Then the virus can also get around when droplets carrying them get on surfaces and then onto your hands. Droplets can fall onto things from a cough or a sneeze or again, just from breathing out um, your breath. They can also be spread around through your hands if you touch your nose or your mouth and you're infected, and then you touch something without cleaning your hands, the virus can get onto that thing. Everywhere your hands can go, the virus can go too from keyboards to patient beds to elevator buttons. And then the virus can go from those surfaces and get picked up by someone else on their hands and make its way onto their eyes, nose, or mouth, eventually infecting them and making them sick. So now that we've covered the ways that germs spread in a healthcare setting, all of this information will come in handy in the next series of videos. We're gonna start talking about the things that we do for infection control to keep germs from spreading. Things like screening patients and staff, or how we use different pieces of personal protective equipment and how they work. And we're gonna talk about how some aspects of SARS-CoV-2 have made infection control especially challenging. Meanwhile, thank you for joining us. As always, please be sure to follow us on Facebook or Twitter and check us out on our website at cdc.gov slash project first line. Thank you for watching and for sharing. We'll see you next episode. Okay, so does anybody wanna change what you um, put on your lists of what I know, what I think I know? Feel free to take a second to do that, particularly the first column, since you listen to Dr. Carlson summarize. So, oops. So, um, when we look at this first column of things that you wrote down, what, um, who would like to share or would anyone like to share what you find most interesting or compelling about the ideas, the items that you've listed in this column? And Brenda, we might refresh on what they put in chat on the first column before, if we have some chat. I know we had comments when we were talking about droplets and respiratory droplets and what those were and people learned in that session that they didn't realize that the virus when you have moisture your the fog on your glasses is um contains virus droplets 
for particles. We do have a question um, and they would like to know, okay, I guess what I would like to know is what are the plans moving forward after a pandemic regarding infection control? <laughs> Boy, that's a million dollar question. That's a great question. Um, I, it's ironic because I just listened to a World Health Organization webinar this morning that had to do with infection prevention and control with respect to pregnant women and women giving birth and the considerations that need to be there. And, and this is an international webinar, keep in mind, and, and they were talking about things in countries where they're so basic that women who are laboring and giving birth don't have access to a toilet while they're delivering a baby. And um, the implications of hand hygiene in countries, you know, we have water available to us everywhere. And we see hand sanitizer everywhere we go now. I mean, you can't walk in a store or a restaurant that doesn't have hand sanitizer in your face when you walk in the door. It's on the counter by the cash registers. It may be in different locations throughout places you go. Um, you go to a Chinese buffet and they have hand sanitizer at the end of the buffet. So uh, we have hand hygiene very much in our face these days here in the United States. But that doesn't mean that we're very compliant with hand hygiene. And the number one mode of transmission is through these things right here. And we learned about um, vectors and fomites and how we transfer things from surface to surface to surface with our hands. We touch pens, um, we touch computer mice, we touch and do we do we use this product in between those places. So where we go in infection prevention is we know that we have to be much more diligent and there are practices that we've put in place because of COVID that we should have really had in place before. The high touch surface cleaning should have been happening. And for you guys working in the communal living settings, you're working in people's homes, whether that's a facility home or their home. But we still have to be very aware of those infection prevention and control things that we can control, which are making sure that we clean our hands, making sure that we clean those surfaces that we touch, whether it's patient equipment or um, equipment that we carry into a home or that we take out of the home. We need to make sure that we continue those practices of cleaning those surfaces. There was just an article yesterday that I didn't read because I really didn't want to know that had to do with stethoscopes. How many of you carry a stethoscope from patient to patient, resident to resident, client to client? Do you in between that visit with that next patient, client, resident, do you clean that stethoscope that you're carrying? You know, for years, we took that stethoscope, we looped it around our neck, we went to the next room, we pulled it off, put it on our ears, we took a blood pressure. And we didn't necessarily do those practices that we should have been doing. And we were knowingly, but really unwittingly, probably, carrying bacteria from one person to the next. And, um, you know, I, I'm reminded in the webinar I listened to today that in our documentation, there's a saying in healthcare that if it's doc not documented, it didn't happen. And in healthcare, we don't document those things that should be happening each and every time we have a patient or a resident or a client contact. And that are those basic infection prevention strategies that are assumed by our public that we do, that we automatically do. But we know that across the board, hand hygiene um, across the board in healthcare is somewhere in the 60 to maybe 90% in a facility that's got a good handle on hand hygiene of compliance to the five moments of hand hygiene and um, washing your hands for the 21 seconds, singing the ABC song, um, you know, singing happy birthday twice. Those are things that that are practice, best practice that should be happening each and every time. And we know they're not happening. And, um, you know, we're in a modern healthcare world. We're not in a third world country that has a bucket of water that they use for hand hygiene. Um, 
So, and they don't have to go somewhere to get that water from somewhere. It, it, we open a tap and we have water to be able to perform hand hygiene. So long, long answer, but I think the biggest thing coming out of this global pandemic is that we maintain good infection prevention practices so that we can be prepared for the next global pandemic that is going to come down the pike. Um, COVID is, as I saw this morning in an article, the first pandemic we've had in this century. The last century we had the, the 1918 flu, we had H1N1, we had um, the first SARS that went through. <coughs> Those were all things that were pandemics that impacted people all over the world. And so um, this isn't the end, but I would hope that we're taking away and learning how to be better prepared when it comes down the pike again. Hopefully we will get SARS, CoV-2, COVID-19 into an endemic status, meaning that it's here, but we've got vaccines and preventative actions in place to prevent it from becoming a big, huge epidemic again. And unfortunately, in we, we look at the rates here in, in Shawnee County, they're going up again. Um, and despite the fact that we are vaccinating more people, but what is happening if we're vaccinated, we're not ending up in the hospital on a ventilator. And um, that's the win. Your, your senior residents that you're taking care of out in the community aren't dying because they've been vaccinated, you're vaccinated, and you're able to help minimize. It isn't obviously making it go away, but we're minimizing the severity of that disease um, that we know is out there and hitting those that are not vaccinated. And people who have mild disease the first time don't get vaccinated. They say they're immune. Well, they're not totally immune. And the next time it comes back to them, it could be potentially a much worse situation. So bottom line, we carry on those infection prevention practices, utilize masks when we know we have a respiratory virus like the flu, utilize hand hygiene, keep surfaces clean, and just be sensitive to, you know, not going into a crowded place when you don't feel good. Keep those bugs home. Um, don't expose people deliberately to whatever virus or problem you have right now. It's not like the chicken pox. Um, you don't want to just arbitrarily expose all kinds of people. So keeping those practices in place is probably the best thing that we can do. That was really long winded Brenda. <laughs> yes, we do have, um, 2 comments here. 1 kind of comes from, you know, a, a mixture of the, what we want to know, think we know, and. But their, their statement is that most folks are ha, have a good deal of knowledge on infection control measures, which is now turned into mandates. Um, so it's kind of hard to see to know what this course is providing that is new or a countermeasure to some of the new information that we know. What they would like to see for future learning would be case studies showing examples of a severe outbreak, some of the statistics that go into that um, in regards to you know vaccine status and the how that outbreak, what that looked like. So I think they're looking for more statistical analysis of data. Um, also points to share on the advantages of vaccination and mask wearing for the same. And then after that, even discussion on the new treatments that are coming out, um, such as the, the antibody treatments. Okay. I think instead of, I think what they're asking there is to let's try to bring some some new information. Um, and then we have another comment here. Many are missing the primary point that vaccination helps avoid severe infection hospitalization with the news of breakthroughs that are muddying the waters. Some see that and think the vaccine is worth worthless. Correct. Yep. Telling stories of the impact of severe COVID long haulers with indefinitely damaged health, long hospital stays, and huge medical bills, which coverage for is ending, is another big selling point. Many only look at the deaths in some of the and some hand waves that with the thought that it mostly affects those of poor health. Talk of being an easier transmitter to others if you're not vaccinated is also another selling point. Thank you guys for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. And those are good points. And I don't know if any of you are um, from Topeka, but we have the current mayor of, well, she's the outgoing mayor now, I think, 
but our mayor here in Topeka, Michelle De La Isla, she is one of those people who had a COVID infection and she has been very upfront and vocal about the long hauler issues that she has and the cardiac issues that she has now that she's had COVID. And um, so the stories, my point in bringing that up is the stories are coming out. The research is happening. The um, Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology, APIC, our, our um, journal is full of articles about COVID and the consequences of COVID and what's happening with the people who had mild symptoms and, and long haul stuff that's happening. Um, you know, a lot of anecdotal stuff happens. Um, people are having joint pain that they never had before because they had a COVID infection that didn't hospitalize them. They may have felt crummy, but they weren't vaccinated. They got COVID and they have joint pain, permanent joint pain. Um, so I think to answer that question about hearing more, stay tuned. I do think that there is more coming out and there are more things that we'll be able to share. And I like the idea of being able to kind of put some of those things together and maybe come up with some case studies. Um, what would be fantastic is if any of you have any personal stories or case case scenarios that you know of that we could do some highlighting and spotlighting of, um, please send them to us. That that's That would be fantastic information to be able to share with people and do some anecdotal story things um, to share. Anything else, Brenda? That's good sharing, guys. Sorry, I was muted, but no, there's no comments. Okay, so um, as we do every time, we want to make sure that you guys know where the resources are. This um, this is an area you can go when you had questions about resources and tools to talk with about people who want to know more about the vaccine or have maybe some hesitancy and you want to share more information. The CDC website for Project First Line has a lot of those things. There's graphics, there's posters. Um, you know, here on this screen, you can see one about respiratory droplets and the fog. It's cold. It's outside. It's cold. When you breathe and you see you see condensation, that's your respiratory droplets going out into the air. So that's a good time for rep excuse me, representing what that looks like. And this graphic helps you talk about that. So when we talked about that last column about what we want to know, we've talked a little bit about that already. Um, CDC is actively collecting information and putting that information out. They're creating blogs. They're creating resources like you see on this page. Um, some of them will be direct focus of future sessions that we're going to talk about, such as a closer look at specific recommendations for PPE, hand hygiene, um, triage and screening, which we're probably not going to get a lot into that with what we're doing with you all. Uh, source control, we do talk about that. Disinfection and environmental cleaning, but there's a lot that we can learn, learn now too. So, so go out to this website, bookmark it, save it. Here's some job aids also, if you wanted to help people understand what a virus is and what the parts of the viruses are. I heard, I, I read something today that said that the United States is the least science educated country around. We don't focus enough on science in our education. You know, we do math education and other things, but we don't do enough science. So we don't have people understanding what science is and that this all falls under the science concept. That's just anecdotal. That's not in my script to talk about, but I read it today. So. Um, these resources are out there and available to you. So let's think about, I'm going to give you a minute to um, reflect and identify personal goals and action steps that you would like to take to help stop disease from spreading. So think about what you would like to do and can do to help stop disease from spreading.
And those are personal goals. You don't have to share them in chat unless you would like to. We'd be happy to hear what people have to say, but. So from today, our key messages are, um, I hope you enjoyed the conversation and here's some key messages. The main way that SARS-CoV-2, the virus causes disease, COVID-19, travels between people and is through respiratory droplets in our breath. And as you guys know, we didn't know that to begin with. That was something when we talk about what can we do carrying forward and how can we understand things, that's a learning that we've learned through the course of this, this um, virus. Another way that you can get sick with COVID-19 is if you touch something that has live SARS-CoV-2 virus on it and then touch your face without cleaning your hands first. Somebody asked about how long viruses live on surfaces. SARS is actually one that doesn't live on surfaces as long as other viruses like VRE. Um, VRE lives on surfaces quite a while and you guys may have encountered that in um, your caring for people. And, you know, that's spread through gut bacteria. Um, so some viruses die quickly, other viruses do not on surfaces. We so, do have one comment. Sure. Um, and it's, it states personally, just learn as much information as you can regarding the science of viruses and infection control. And then take that knowledge and educate staff. Um, that way we can continue to do our best at keeping infections low and doing our best to not spread illness, disease, and other viruses. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, again, here's the places that you can go for additional resources. And um, we'll take your thoughts into consideration for how we might move forward in continuing education. We host a um, office hours call through KFMC where we we do that once a month and the communal living setting which you guys all fall into that bucket um we have fairly low attendance in fact this last week we had a call and nobody came on except for KFMC staff and KDHE HAI program staff so that is a, a venue that we can begin to move some things forward and help provide some information. It's also a place for you all to um, call in and ask questions and hopefully get some additional knowledge from the, the people who are on the call. And um, it also helps us to determine what we wanna take forward. And um, so check out the communal living call and um, here's some additional resources. And as always, please give us feedback. We appreciate your feedback. When we're done with this series, we'll we'll have some kind of evaluation to have you guys fill out to let us know what you thought about it. Um, so that's all I have for you today. We have a minute left if anybody has anything they wanna bring up. We appreciate you guys joining us. We hope you're finding these sessions valuable and we really wanna make them more valuable for you. So, and be able to provide additional conversation or education for you. I'm actually meeting with Brenna Stacy, who is the, the director of the HAI program for KDHE. When we get off the call, we have a lunch once a month on a Friday and I'm going directly to meet her now. So I will take some of the comments that you guys have made today um, forward because she's the keeper of, of the funds to provide education like this, and we want to make it worthwhile. So thank you all for attending and we'll talk to you. We won't see you next Friday, but we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks for joining us. All right, I think. All right, we'll see you later. Bye.